Hello, and welcome to A Taste of My Life, the show that serves up people's lives with something of a twist. This is a culinary trip down memory lane. about who we are and what we do. It tells us a great deal about the way we live our lives. So what better way to get to know our guest than by sampling the tastes and flavors of their life? Although today's guest has already had a successful career as a musician, he first came to prominence in the bawdy costume drama, Tom Jones. <laughs> personal tragedy struck with the unexpected death of his mother. He dealt with the trauma by taking on a gritty role in the hit medical drama, Bodies. Give us some more. <laughs> Not me. Give us some more. All right, I will. But most recently, he's entertained viewers as the deputy manager of the most salacious hotel ever to grace our TV screens. You have all the attributes of a good receptionist. You're polite, handsome, flirtatious, and yet strangely sexual. Well, thank you. Yes, today's guest will be joining me in the kitchen is actor, musician, keen chef, and heartthrob, Max Beasley. Coming up on today's show, Max the chef is given something of a rib tickling by his stepbrother, Jason. Max, like I say, you can't do it. Just needs to get the portion sizes sorted out. <laughs> College friend and singer Omar gives us the lowdown on Max's taste in women. <laughs> and he reveals how tough it was doing the medical drama Bodies after the tragic death of his mum. It was my sort of homage to my mother, you know. Easily. Welcome to a Taste of Souls with no butter uh, or um, low fat butter w w was good for me, but I actually I hated it because, you know, I didn't like there was no taste really. Which is precisely why I'm going to rustle up something tasty and succulent with some fried halibut. Lightly seasoned flour, plenty of butter in the pan, and all those horrid memories of boiled fish will fade away. I can remember my mum steaming fish between two plates on top of a saucepan, and I knew what I was getting for supper because you could you actually hear the rattling from sort of miles away. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, that was the same thing. I had the fear in me whenever I saw the pressure cooker being brought out of the cupboard, because I knew, and well, I actually didn't know what she'd be cooking because she used to steam absolutely everything. So um, I think the fish went in there, the new potatoes. I can see the new potatoes now, with the skin still stuck to the... Um, metal plate that was in the pressure cooker uh, and they're trying to salvage them out of there you know parsley and oil on top a plump baked potato and as a tribute to max's mum boiled broccoli i would have much, much preferred to have eaten this in 1978. what was your sort of favorite meal of the day i mean was it was it breakfast was it tea time was it? tea time tea time um, in up, up there, it's like, you know, uh, six, seven o'clock. And then one thing my ma used to make great, actually, she used to make great spaghetti bolognese, and she used to call it something different than that, which was rather rude, but um, great spaghetti bolognese, really lovely. That was it. Look, I'm going in for my tea. It's just a weird thing, that, isn't it? I used to go, all right, kid, I'll see you straight after, and we'll have a vibe, and then we'll go and tuck in and then get back out again, you know. <laughs> So, your mum died quite recently. You know, all our parents die, it's inevitable, isn't it? Yeah, it's, it's the one certain thing that we're probably most unprepared for as humans, you know. But she was um, a naturally very talented woman. She had a, an amazing art for singing. And she started working at the age of about 14. So a very strong uh, individual woman, a survivor. Um, and I have a lot of her things, I think, in me. 
I've got a nice balance between my mother and, and my father. It's a strange thing because it's the biggest fear of your life, yet um, it's something that you kind of work through and overcome. So there's that sense of guilt. In, there are many, many, many things going on, you know. But um, yeah, she, she, she died um, too early, I'd say, um, by a um, misadventure, you know, a, a, an accident in a hospital, um, <clears throat> which was, which made it very difficult for when the body script came through to um, take that job on. <laughs> now it was a really important role for me that you know because um it turned a lot of things around i think for me with the work and more importantly was my sort of homage to my mother you know now have you got your brothers and sisters or were you the only one the family history is uh, very similar to um dallas if you ever saw <laughs> dallas. <laughs> it's dallas, really yeah. really crazy now i've got a elder brother gary um who's an amazing guy and sister katie who again is one of the loveliest people you'll ever meet she's just gorgeous you know got a stepbrother jason who kind of I, I really grew up with you know he's just one of the loveliest guys you'll ever meet you know he, he's a diamond now i've got a little bit of a surprise for you. we're looking to we're looking forward to a fantastic meal that max cooked for us one christmas um looking probably about seven years ago now it was just after max had spent um £3,000 on a cookery course, if you remember that. It was going to be lamb. So, the plan was, lovely bit of lamb, and uh, we were told that all day long we weren't allowed to eat um, a single thing, otherwise it would spoil our dinner. Which was uh, fine, until we realised that dinner was taking at least seven hours to cook. <laughs> so, uh, by then, we're all absolutely famished, and uh, Max brings out the dinner, which was... A child's portion. A child's portion of well, like a like a newborn actually. A newborn portion of food. Big calorie, which uh, left us all starving. So I'm just going to attempt to recreate that dinner today. Uh, obviously, I'm not going to scrimp and save in my portion. They're going to be uh, whoppers. Obviously, this is just for one person. I've just been Max's portion. It would uh, this would be for twenty. He's I've got all the equipment, as you can see. He's a scumbag. No, he's the best brother. I'm going to uh, take these babies. What's happening over here? <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm starting to get a bit of colour on these now. Yeah, we were in a curry house that night. And uh, the after eights had come out. You know, they sometimes put after eights. And we ripped the after eight paper, stuck them on our teeth. <laughs> You're doing this right, right? <laughs> Nigel. He'll want to be better than Nigel. <laughs> like he wants to be better than everyone. That's uh, remarkably scalding on the fingers. Lovely. So this is the vibe. I think this is how you get your... Uh, your jus. Or gravy. If you're from Levin Zoo. Let's see what's in there. That white. Not bad. No, that's a put in there. Just white in it. Levens in Manchester, it's gravy. <laughs> he, really, he really is one of the kind of people who would give you the shirt off his back. And in actual fact, I've had, I've had approximately 20 shirts off his back. Um, my, my whole, actually, my whole wardrobe's full of actually clothes. There you go, mate. Suck it. <laughs> You're sensing a little bit of competitiveness there. No, that's great, man. I had no idea he'd done that. He's a really popular guy. You've got a lot of actually quite high-profile friends. Yeah, I've got five or six very, 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 very close friends, which is great. 
um, and a couple of them are high profile. You cook for them? I do actually, yeah. And um, my girlfriend's friends, oh, she's got all her girlfriends, yeah. um, do get the ump if, if the Sunday roast isn't on, if I'm working or something, because there's nowhere else that they will go for them that want to go other than my house, because I'm, I do make a, a blinding Sunday roast, you know. It's funny this thing about friends, people who cook, you always end up with a lot of mates. Yeah. You you, just, uh, yeah, you do. <laughs> and one of your friends from a long time ago um, has got a little surprise for you. There's no Years now since uh, that we've known each other, so that's uh, that's uh, or 20 years best mates, as you would say. <laughs> um, so it's uh, it's been fun, man. You know what I mean? Uh, he he helped me out when I was at school, and I got uh, expelled from boarding because I was a naughty boy back then. Um, so it's great. Uh, this is um, stew chicken. Has uh, talked to me by several relatives. Kind of a standard West Indian dish. I can't believe he's Well, he was like two years below us in school, and I just remember he was always trying to get in with the, with the older lads and stuff, and he finally managed to do it, because we had a band, it was a great a school band called Jazz Tracks. I remember, well, well, you know, just after it was the end of term, and um, uh, my mum had met his mum for the first time after I'd stayed in the house after getting kicked out, and uh, she said, I hope he, was he all right? She said, yeah, yeah. He wanted to smoke, but yeah, I told him we had to go into the, into the garden, and uh, my mum didn't know I smoked at that time, so thanks a lot. <laughs> I don't know if that's a program, but and I don't put this in if it's not, it's not a program. He, I mean, he always wanted to introduce his ugly girlfriends to, <laughs> to school, <laughs> which is, uh, I mean, obviously it's changed now because his taste has got a lot better, but when he was 15, he needed a little bit of that. Some teaching, teaching skills. Chicken stock. Chicken stock. It's, 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 it's cute. Um, which I don't think I have. No. Bisto. Bisto. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he's putting me bisto in. It's a turkey, isn't it? It's the same species, isn't it? <laughs> oh, he's just whacking it in. Now, I don't know how we're going to do this, but maybe put in a piece of uh, Tupperware from the weapon. Maybe you can have a piece. So I can offer you a bit of a nice chicken stew, can't I? Absolutely, I'm, I'm very excited to see if he's uh, battered the chicken or not. Let's have a look. It's nice though, isn't it? Very, very good. Oh, my. So how come you ended up um, working with Rob Williams? I uh, played in the, the, would take that, I played with the band and befriended um, Rob there, became very friendly with Jason as well and uh, yeah. he is a phenomenal, phenomenal performer. One of the best I've ever worked with, you know. And on top of that, if he's your mate to boot as well, that's just great, isn't it? Still to come on A Taste of My Life, Max lets us in on the secrets of Mariah Carey's Penne alla Ribiata. Makes a great bit of pasta, old Mariah. Friend and co-star from Tom Jones, Brian Blessed remembers a very innocent and naive young actor. You, know, you always felt, because you were very green as an actor, that you had to eat all the food on the set all the time. You know, he'd only nibble it, experienced actors like Nino Z. And Max reveals his fantasy dinner guests over a final feast that will have you swooning. Maybe Marilyn could be serving the food in a kind of pinnacle with nothing else on. Do you ever cook to impress? I'm talking maybe girlfriends here. If you can make someone laugh, Mm. And play the piano and cook quite well. I think you're, uh, I think you're in good stead. Just maybe whack out a bit of bark here and then throw in a nice salmon tartar. Boom! And I've surely, surely, I've got to be in. The one thing that you specifically, the one kind of one dish. Italian stuff. Quite yeah, easy. A little bird also. told me you're quite good at, at pasta. I did some work with a lady called Mariah Carey. Yeah. Uh, who's lovely. Uh, the film wasn't lovely, um, but no, when I, when I was working with Mariah, I tasted her uh, Arabiata and it was fantastic, really good. She makes a great bit of pasta, old Mariah. So you cook for your friends and you cook for your girlfriends. Mm. I'd rather open, you might cook for me. Well, I can have a go, sir. Have a go, I'll have a go. I always like a bit of a challenge.
Looks like Max is keen to go it alone on this one. Okay, so we're going to start by dicing some chilies just to give it a bit of a bit of a vibe. And I, li I like to use quite a lot of chili and also um, keep the seeds in there as well. It depends on what you, who your guests are, whether they like the hot stuff or not. But I personally love it. What I want to do is, with the chilies and the garlic um, and the basil, flavour this oil up. Look at that, that's just great for the heart attack. And then um, I'll just throw this in and that's you know, my favourite bit, basil. Pull this out somehow. That oil's getting nicely flavoured now. Lovely. Now we're just gonna. Oh, well, it's just wilted. You're not really overcooking it. Dry your basil off before you uh, wilt it. Otherwise, you'll get that horrendous effect. And goes the tomatoes. So, I'll turn that in round about now. I'll throw these babies back in now. Give it a little, uh, little stir. This could uh, burn our throats out, Nigel. Just do a little bit of that. Keep some of the roots of the basil in because I just love it. Or like I say, we'll add a little bit of oil to the pasta to give it a nice glaze. Take the top off, that's always a help. It's lovely. I like the idea of flavouring the oil. Um, I used to throw everything in at the beginning and clutter it up with loads of different soft herbs. But I think that the simplicity of it is what, what makes this really nice, just with basil. Get all of that in there. There it is, Penny Alla Ribiata, Mr Nigel Slater, from his first student of the day. I'm really scared. Yeah, the meat is spicy, really. It is spicy, isn't it? Oh, it's gorgeous. Nice one. Thank you. Nice one. Yeah, very good. But of course, your first real big break was Tom Jones. Yeah, it was really. And um, <clears throat> I suppose in hindsight, that was a really, really great, great gig to get. I think it was, um, it took a few people by surprise getting that role. Since you do me the honour of asking, sir, I'm marching north against the pretender and his rebels in the service of liberty and his majesty, King George. I was quite green in the first sort of couple of days of filming and, and my confidence grew throughout the, the shoot, which was a five-month shoot. And it was a great, great um, initiation, if you like, into, into the acting world. Of course, you got a chance to work with Brian Blessed. Well, Brian Blessed is um, such a lovely man. You know, he does these crazy things. You know, he, I think he's attempted Everest a couple of times. And he does things like, he'll say to me, so I'm going in the original 1920s gear. And I'll go, what? <laughs> and he'll say, well, Sherpa Henson, darling, can do it, so can I. I've got a little message for you from him. <laughs> Did you really catch up with him? You once described me. <laughs> as being a cross between a yeti and a holy man. <laughs> this is a yeti and a holy man. So you, you, you always said to people, oh, you've got to have the Brian Blessed experience. But, I mean, I must say that I also have a Max Beasley. I've always found you ultra sensitive, a, a young man of great vision. <laughs> Marvellous day as regards food, you know, you always felt, because you were very green as an actor, that you had to eat all the food on the set all the time, you know, he did not nibble it, experienced actor like Nino said, of course, there's no end to my talents, you know, so <laughs> I just nibble at things and pretend to eat it, but you ate it till your stomach got bigger and bigger and bigger. <laughs> I don't think to a certain you've not spoken yet. You've got so much to offer. There's so much to discover about you as an actor. But you have all the seeds of greatness. And I think you'll achieve it. And I admire you immensely. I'm absolutely flattered and honoured that Brian said those things because um, I hold him right up 
there, you know, and, and, and it's a weird thing, isn't it, when you don't, in this, in this business that we're in, you know, you, you, you're lucky if you meet one or two people or maybe one a job or maybe one every two or three jobs that you actually really stay in contact with. And then, of course, you moved on to Hotel Babylon and played the sort of deputy manager in what was actually an incredibly salacious and saucy hotel. Complimentary sessions in our after business now. Whatever or whoever you want to be, we'll look after you. I think it's very glamorous, very stylized, and for me as an actor, it, it enables me to have a bit of fun with the character, um, which is a lovely juxtapose from doing something like Bodies, for instance, which is really mentally very, very, very heavy and, and, uh, and depressing, you know, in, 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 a, in a weird way. As you have become more and more successful, um, do you find that your tastes have changed? I mean, on the grapevine, I've heard that you're um, rather fond of uh, a bit of lobster. Lobster uh, is something that um, I, I, I hadn't really experienced as a kid growing up in um, Burnage, South Manchester. It wasn't a delicacy of the area, really. I'm pulling out all the stops here. A beautifully boiled large lobster, coated in cheese sauce and grilled for just a short while. I always used to see lobster on the, on, on the menu and, and kind of have an attachment to that, which was a kind of, as a working class kid, it was definitely a thing of, that's for the affluent, the lobster. Oh, I'll try that Monday. You know, I'll have a go on that. I ate lobster for the first time. Yeah, I can't remember now. It, it was years ago, but in one of these places. And um, I really liked it. I liked it. It had quite a weird texture and a weird taste, but I think half of it was the idea of ordering lobster. And it was, it was role play, definitely, you know. And, if that isn't enough, some garlic breadcrumb scallops. Again, the knack with these guys is not to overcook them. Literally a minute or two under the grill until they're almost opaque. I mean, this is okay. I mean, lobster is pretty wonderful. It's almost status symbol food in a way, isn't it? This is actually probably the largest one I've ever seen in my life. This is, this is the I've made it lobster. Yeah. This guy's had an incredible life, so I don't feel too bad about eating him. This is like, you know, you do lots of things and you suddenly realise, actually, I'm doing something very exciting, I'm doing what I want to do. And was ever that point when you just thought, actually, this is really rather good? I do pinch myself, and I do, I feel very, 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 very lucky to be healthy, first of all, but to be able to, you know, eat well, to, to go on nice holidays now and again, you know. I also do have those working-class ethics in store, which make me think whenever I do go and buy an expensive bottle of wine, I can hear my dad just going absolutely psychotic in the back of my mind, thinking, you must be crazy weighing in with all that money, you know. So, for your final feast, what are we eating? Uh, for starters, we're going to have a capaccio of veal um, with a bit of olive oil on it, and uh, some shavings of parmesan cheese. Yeah. Uh, then, um, beautiful pieces of meat here, uh, sealed and then cooked medium, but sort of French medium, medium rare, um, along with an aubergine gâteau. Uh, I came across the veal by accident. In, in Venice, I was doing a film with uh, Mike Figgis called Hotel, and uh, we went over to uh, Cipriani Hotel, and um, someone ordered it for me, and I ate it, and it just melted in my mouth. It was the most amazing thing. But it is your last meal, so I guess you've got to be that way. It's got to be that Anybody way to do anything. You like the pizza rolls. I adore the pizza rolls. I'm big on pizza rolls and chocolate eclairs. It is naughty, that is me. Carpaccio veal, a layered aubergine gatto, simple steak fillets, and rounding off with profiteroles.
dreams. It's been a very full, very, very busy life, but there must be something you have. Yeah. I haven't won a BAFTA. I haven't won an Oscar. And I haven't filmed with Robert De Niro. What is it that makes you really happy? Um... I don't, do you know what? This is going to be a strange answer. I really like the sky. Yeah? Does that sound weird? I love the sky. I, I've got a weird thing about it. I can go home to Ham, Hampton Court, kneel on my bed and open the, the... I've got a big open window at the back and look in the garden for about two hours on my knees and nothing, nothing else exists in the world, you know? And I really do love work, filming. I love work. I love going and feeling like I'm, I'm doing something with my day. Who would be present at your final feast? I mean, we know what you're eating, but who can eat it with? Well, this is a tricky one, but I definitely like De Niro. Um, sitting here, and Christopher Walken, uh, who I love. I like Richard Burton. Um, I thought he was a monstrous actor. I thought he was just a phenomenon, you know. Steve McQueen. Yeah. If I could have a, ha, I had a lady that in, in there, it would have to be uh, Marilyn Monroe. That was my first ever crush. <sighs> okay. Yeah, I need to get one in somewhere. Maybe Marilyn could be serving the food in a kind of pinnacle with nothing else on. Okay. Is that okay? Absolutely fine. Not okay. Thank you. Thank you very much for being on the taste of my life. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Appreciate Thank you. it. Hey to you, thanks ever so much, it's been a real pleasure. What stays and what goes to auction, some difficult choices, but the ultimate goal is to get around the world on a cruise with Cash in the Attic next on BBC2.